Hey, good afternoon, everybody. At least it's afternoon as I'm recording this on Sunday. Um, this is my lecture on Shakespeare's uh, The Tempest. Um, note that for next week, we're doing A Tempest, um, which I'll talk about um, a little bit more um, in a bit here, um, which is a kind of a rewriting of The Tempest, um, known as A Tempest by Cesar. Um, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about that um, at the end of this lecture, a little bit is kind of an introduction. Um, so some background information on Shakespeare, um, some background information on theater in Shakespeare's day. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about the setting of the play because that's really um, important. Um, I'll go over the characters briefly just to make sure that you've got those straight. And then um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the themes that I'd like you to kind of think about from The Tempest that we'll look in, um, look at it a little more depth in A Tempest, um, themes having to do with European colonialism. Um, so first some background on uh, Shakespeare. Uh, he lived between 1564 and 1616. Um, we don't know a lot about his personal life. Um, much of what we know about him is really through his plays. Um, and um, just some court records, uh, wills, marriage certificate, his tombstone, um, but not a whole lot other than that. Um, yeah, however, there are quite a few anecdotes and criticisms by people who were his rivals and friends uh, that we've been able to glean some information from as well. Um, we don't know his exact birthday in 1564, um, but um, that's, um, what has been recorded as his birthday. He was the third child of John and Mary Shakespeare. Um, he had seven siblings, um, five of whom I believe survived, uh, two didn't survive, which it, as I said before was, um, was not uncommon. Um, we know from his baptism records that his father was uh, an official in the town of Stratford in England and a local businessman uh, who did work in tanning and leather work, you know, making gloves and purses and those kind of things. Um, and also potentially dealt in grain. Um, sometimes his official trade has been as a glover. And again, a glover is somebody who would kind of make things out of um, leather, um, an, an artisan of a kind. Um, John was a prominent man in Stratford. He was one of 14 Burgesses, which formed the local town council. Um, John uh, Shakespeare has also been described as a very good businessman. And it appears that William kind of inherited some of that business acumen uh, from his father. Um, William was actually, was able to do um, quite well for himself from various endeavors. Um, his mother was Mary Arden. She married John Shakespeare in 1557. Uh, she was the youngest daughter in her family. And she also inherited much of her father's landowning and farming estate when he died. Um, and so we can assume that some of that wealth potentially was handed down to William as well. Um, the Bard's education, you'll frequently ref you know, hear playwrights and poets referred to as bards. If you hear somebody refer to the bard, in general, they're referring to Shakespeare. Um, that's kind of a second name for him as the, as known as the, um, certainly the most famous of the, the playwrights during this period. Um, we know that he attended King's New Grammar School, where he was taught basic reading and writing, in addition to Latin and literature. Um, both of those obviously very important for his development as a playwright. Um, we assume that he attended this school since it existed to educate the sons of people in Stratford, though we don't have any definitive proof of that. Um, and interestingly though, his work is studied almost universally at universities. We have no evidence to really suggest that he actually attended a university himself, um, which again is, is a um, interesting, um, facet of his life, if indeed he didn't attend a university. 
um, that he was able to learn as much as he did for the King's New Grammar School. And then obviously uh, was also an autodidact, was also self-taught, um, learned a lot from the things that, that he read. So having that background in Latin and literature would have also been very beneficial to him. Um, he married an older woman in 18, uh, 1582, excuse me, um, when he was 18 year old and she was 18 year old and she was 26, her name was Anne Hathaway. Um, Anne had never left Stratford and spent her whole life there. Um, when they married, uh, she was seven months pregnant and uh, their first child was named Susanna. Um, baptism records show that Susanna was baptized in Stratford sometime in 1583. There were also twins, Hamnet and Judas, that were born in February of 1592. Hamnet was William's only son who died in 1596 at just 11 years old. Um, his family was unusually small for the time when families were larger, like his, his, um, his mother and father's family was. Again, he had a number of siblings, though we know a number passed away. Um, so the evidence um, of Shakespeare as a poet, um, some of you might be aware of all of the interesting conspiracy theories, in particular by a group called the Oxfords, um, about whether or not uh, William Shakespeare, the, the historical figure that we know uh, from the documents that do exist, but actually was the writer of these great plays because he didn't seem to have a university of education. He was not a high born individual um, being from Stratford and not from you know, a, a main, major urban center. Um, and so people wonder, did somebody else perhaps write these plays and were they published under his name? And there are lots of different theories about who other potential uh, playwrights could have been. Uh, whose plays were eventually published under the name William Shakespeare, Francis Bacon, probably the most famous of those people. Um, the conspiracy theories are kind of fun and interesting. Uh, you might want to look at some of those, but the vast majority of scholars believe that indeed William Shakespeare, the historical figure, again, that we know from the documents that exist, was in fact the playwright. Um, the first piece of evidence we have is from a poem called Venus and Adonis that was um, entered into the stationer's registrar in April of 1593. So he would have been 29 at that point, rather old, uh, to be publishing his first work. Um, his second poem, The Rage of Lucretia, was published then in, in um, 1594, um, a little over a year later. Um, he did suffer at one point a breach of copyright in 1609. A number of his sonnets were published without his permission. Um, it's considered unlikely that he really wanted those published because some of those were really kind of deeply personal um, poems, the kind that one writes uh, for oneself or to another individual, um, a lover perhaps, but does not want published. Um, so we know that um, he ended up spending much of his life in London, away from Stratford. Stratford was a good distance from London. And it's, it's, uh, it's believed that once he moved to London and started working there um, in the theater, that he perhaps only returned to Stratford during major holidays um, and um, some times here and there when, um, when the theater was closed, but that he spent the vast majority of his time in London. It was four days ride from Stratford. So again, a decent distance. Um, so for some 20 years, it seemed like he was basically living away from home. Um, the theaters um, were closed uh, at, at some points, especially during religious holidays. He may have also you know, gone home at those points. Uh, they were considered diversionary entertainment. Um, and just in, in general, um, the theater at the time was viewed as something for kind of working class people. Um, it was viewed as somewhat vulgar and somewhat kind of common. Um, the people who attended the theater were mostly commoners. It was pretty inexpensive uh, for the most part. Um, Shakespeare certainly did write for you know, a wide variety of characters, even though you know, we know many of them through the names of the plays having been um, you know, kings and queens and, and other sort of aristocrats. Um, he did write also um, 
characters who were commoners. And he also did write about uh, rural life and urban life. And it's believed that he was able to do so effectively because Stratford was relatively rural um, and, and obviously then living the rest of his life in London that he really understood life in a rural area and life in an urban area. Um, it, it is true that um, aristocrats, including you know, the king and queen would attend the theater at times. Um, and it was, um, again, that was used as kind of diversionary entertainment. For them, it would have been viewed as, as maybe a guilty pleasure of sorts. Um, and Shakespeare did, um, did write plays for, um, you know, for the aristocracy, the monarchy, um, about their lives and historical events and things like that, kind of working in fictional characters. Um, we know that in 1597, William purchased what was called New Place, which is a big plot of land uh, in Stratford and actually the second largest house. So he must have acquired money by that point in his life and again had money from his family as well. Uh, though his father experienced financial hardship, um, we do know that his mother, his mother had some, some money. Um, and as well as being a playwright, which is what we really remember Shakespeare for, he was also an actor at one point and um, a theater owner and the owner of an acting troupe. And it's likely that that's where a good bit of his money came from as well. And I'll talk a little bit about, more about that in a minute. Um, in 1605, it seems like he made a major financial gain, um, again, buying lots of land. Um, and that perhaps that land and being able to um, utilize that land, um, perhaps was able to acquire the wealth that allowed him to really focus on playwriting, you know, pretty uninterrupted. He could really focus on that and make that a career. So between the land, um, the real estate he owned near Stratford, um, perhaps some inheritance, um, definitely his investments in the theater, um, again, as a theater owner, owner of an act, a member of an acting company and also, um, an actor and playwright, you know, that he was able to do fairly well for himself. Um, he revised his will, will in 1616, uh, presumably because he was ill and then died uh, later in 1616. This was, he, the will was revised in March and he died in April. He's buried in Holy Trinity Church in Stratford, which is a place that many people, you know, go and visit, um, make a pilgrimage to his gravesite. Um, he left, um, you know, what he owned at that point to his eldest daughter, most of it to Susanna, um, some things to his wife as well, and also to uh, some actors um, who were in the acting troupe with him, and I believe part owners in various times of the theater, Richard Burbage, Henry Condell, and John Hemmings. Um, and um, they definitely were part of his you know, support system and vice versa during his time in working in the theater in London. Um, his famous last words written on his tombstone was basically saying, you know, let me rest in peace. Uh, good friend for Jesus sake forbear to dig the dust enclosed here. Blessed be man that spares these stones and cursed be the man that moves my bones. Um, so, um, a little, you know, clever humor of the Shakespearean sort there. Um, again, I mentioned all these conspiracy theories. Did he write all these plays? We know of 37 plays and 154 sonnets. I mentioned the Oxfords, which is a group that, that believes that there was some kind of other author for the plays. Uh, I mentioned Francis Bacon is a potential author. Um, Edward de Vere is another one who's mentioned frequently, but again, the vast majority of scholars do credit the, um, these great works to William Shakespeare of Stratford. Um, some of the, the, the earliest proof that we have that William did indeed write the plays was a criticism by Robert Greene, um, who um, attacked Shakespeare at times. Um, he called him an upstart crow at one point, um, you know, kind of a new person on the scene who makes a big splash. Um, those criticisms were in place in the stationer's registrar 
1592. This was obviously a place, this registrar, where things were published. Um, proof that he was an actor comes from his performances at, um, before Queen Elizabeth herself in 1594. Um, and his name was also listed in 1594 and 1595 as a shareholder and part owner of the Lord Chamberlain's Company. That's the theater company I mentioned earlier, which was later just known by a, a shorter name as the King's Men. Um, again, in 1598, his reputation of poet is seemingly confirmed, being attacked uh, by Francis Mears um, as mellifluous um, sugared sonnets among his private friends. A lot of this you can really tell is people who were jealous of him making these criticisms, uh, not surprisingly, especially because, again, he's an upstart from rural Stratford. He's relatively uneducated um, and arrives on the scene and and, and becomes the star, um, as it were, of the theater scene. Um, we know of him also being listed as uh, one of the owners of the Globe Theater. Uh, there were actually two Globe Theaters, 1599-1603. Uh, the first Globe Theater burned down um, during a performance in which they would shoot off a, can a cannon. And the cannon, I believe, lit the roof on fire. Uh, these were you know, basically buildings with uh, they were you know, basically made out of wood and things that were very flammable. Uh, and then it was, um, it was rebuilt. Um, theaters, along with houses of prostitution and bars and other kinds of place that were frequented by you know, commoners, lowlifes, et cetera. That was where the, um, the theater was also located on the opposite side of the Thames River, the bad side. Um, at one point, however, supposedly during the winter, the Globe Theater was taken apart and moved to the other side of the Thames. And, and there, I, I believe it, it remained till its final days. Um, William did um, earn extra money in the Kingsmen for his court performances that he continued to do. Um, again, uh, some of the plays, um, involving uh, monarchs, aristocrats. Um, Macbeth was celebrates King James I, ancestor Malcolm, is uh, considered to be written in appreciation, the king's patronage, etc. cetera. Um, these plays were originally published in folios, kind of like a portfolio, but a portfolio of, of writings in 1623, uh, which is what people refer to most frequently as evidence that that William Shakespeare did and write these did indeed write these plays. Somebody would have had to have used his name, you know, um, instead of their own name on this this folio for this to actually be the case. But we know the relationship with these other theater owners and 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 um, actors as well. But this was 1623, um, and um, in terms of its value, the first folio originally was sold for just one pound in 1623. Today is one of just 250 still in existence. It would fetch nearly $3 million. And that was a number of, of years ago. So if you happen to have a copy of Shakespeare's portfolio, uh, first folio hanging around. Um, ben Johnson, a well-known critic and writer, um, also wrote about Shakespeare, both criticizing him and praising him. Um, and um, he was, you know, again, one of his rivals. So again, you can see elements of jealousy here, but nonetheless, you know, clearly really respected him, um, claiming that his works were timeless, describing them as not of an age, but for all time. That's a really important, obviously, kind of um, accolade, um, claiming that somebody is writing and capable of writing very effectively about what we would call universal themes, right? Things that were not just relevant and interesting to people living at the time, um, and, and, and really kind of limited historically, but somebody who's able to write about these themes that seem to be universal, um, that seem to be for all time, that seem to be resonant with people from many different cultures and different translations of these plays. Um, and that's obviously very difficult to do, right? You've got to really dig deep. You've got to really understand human nature well. You have to be a student of human nature. Um, you have to be able to deal comfortably and effectively with all kinds of you know, existential kind of themes about life and death and, and uh, where life gains its meaning from. 
um, human relationships, family, right? All those kinds of, of things. So that's about as high praise as you can get somebody saying that your plays were timeless. Um, let me just briefly show you here a picture of Shakespeare. I'm sure you've probably seen pictures before. Um, this is, comes from one of the most famous um, of the pictures of, of Shakespeare. Um, there are lots of different versions of the same picture floating around. So I mentioned um, the Globe Theater and that there were actually two Globe Theaters. There was actually another theater called the Black Friars that was um, built later. Um, it was all indoors. The Globe had an, had an open roof and I'll show you a couple of pictures of that in a minute. Um, the Black Friars was a little more expensive. It probably catered a little more to people who were a little better off because it was a little more expensive. It was indoors. Um, it was kind of a nicer setting. Um, people have um, done reconstructions of the Globe Theater and the Black Friars Theater. And again, I'll show you a couple of those. Um, and so you can kind of see what they, what they look like. Um, I know there are quite a few descriptions of them kind of floating around as well. Um, here's a sort of an older picture of uh, the Globe Theater. Uh, so you can get a sense what it looked like. So um, it was relatively small. You can kind of see the, the size of the, the, the windows and, and a couple of the figures that you can perhaps see on the stage there. It's a, it's a relatively small building. Um, the uh, area around the outside you can see was covered by a roof. So you were out of the weather and it was tiered. Um, and then you could barely see there, but just in front of the stage is where most of the peasants would come to watch the play. You had to stand there, there were no seats. And it was the, also the only place that was uncovered. So you would get wet if the weather was bad. Um, the seating around the outside was more expensive. That was covered. You can see that there also is, is uh, something built out over the stage. So the stage was covered. Um, it's believed perhaps that there was a painting of the, um, of the sky above the stage, um, you know, giving it this, this celestial kind of feel, right? Called the globe theater, right? We think of the earth as the globe and, and then you have the sky above it, um, et cetera. Um, that was something actually that was, would become fairly common in, um, Theaters, more, more more contemporary theaters, and and uh, by more contemporary I mean, like you know, nineteenth century, twentieth century, uh, to have, um, and not just as you would have in churches, um, kind of religious paintings, but to have paintings of the sky, the stars, clouds. Um, I've been in the theater, I believe it was in Richmond, um, that. Um, when, when the lights are on, you're looking up and you see, you know, the clouds in the sky. I believe that one also rotates very gradually. Some of them do. Um, then when the lights go down, you can see the stars. Um, so there are, you know, little lights in, in the ceiling. Um, these are obviously very expensive, very difficult to do. Um, you had to have a, uh, people that had a lot of skill to be able to create those kinds of things. But perhaps this is, you know, the originator of that basic idea. Um, this is where in the Globe Theater, uh, Globe One or Globe Two, we believe most of the tragedies were written. Um, he also did write comedies. You can see there's a lot of comedic aspects to The Tempest, which some people believe was one of the last of his plays, if not the last of his plays. Um, if you look at the epilogue at the end of the play, um, it can be read as, um, even though kind of literally it reads, it's, it's perhaps Prospero speaking, um, it can be read as Shakespeare himself speaking and, and saying that I'm, I'm retiring and this is the end of my career and thank you for your patronage and your support, but now I must, you know, use my own magic, which was the great skill he had as a writer, and retire and, you know, live the rest of my life. Uh, as a normal human being, you know, kind of idea. So you might want to check that out in the uh, the very end of the the play. I believe it's the epilogue of the play. Um, so I mentioned the thatch roof burning down. It was a performance of Henry VIII that that occurred. Um, 
the exposed seats that were called the yard um, in front of the stage there, um, it's believed that the, the people um, in particular in the yard would eat hazelnuts while they were watching the plays. If that you know, instead of popcorn, you'd eat hazelnuts. Um, and um, it was not known whether or not that was actually apocryphal, but when they did an excavation of the Globe Theater, they did in fact find all of these hazelnuts, um, uh, remnants of these hazelnuts. So it seems like that might've in fact been the case that there were these, um, that people ate hazelnuts. It would also give them something, the shells maybe relatively soft to stand on as they would you know, mash the shells underneath their feet uh, during the long time they were having to stand and watch the, um, watch the play since they did not have uh, seats in the yard area. Um, here is another picture of a reconstruction of the Globe Theater. Again, there are quite a few of them. Um, there actually is an area not too far from here in Canada called Stratford that, that does a big Shakespeare festival every year. Um, sometimes I have students who have been um, um, gone to see a play or plays from that uh, festival. But this gives you a sense again for, um, for what it looks like. Um, again, the, the yard area that's uncovered, the area that is covered around the outside, the stage. Um, and um, so you can see sort of a uh, kind of a, a, um, a model of what the, uh, what the Globe Theater sort of looked like. And, and also why uh, if you're shooting a cannon off from on stage, you could potentially set the roof on fire, which again, unfortunately happened. Um, I mentioned the other theater, the latter theater called the Blackfriars Theater. This came after Globe One and Two. Um, and there are also reconstructions of the Blackfriars Theater. Um, th this picture happens to be a reconstruction of the Blackfriars Theater that is in Stanton, Virginia. That was actually um, built, financed by um, some friends of, of my wife and my family, um, where they obviously do Shakespeare's plays and other kinds of uh, performances and things. Um, the, um, the family who financed the construction of this theater, um, their daughter was actually married um, in the theater. It's, it's beautiful. I've been in it a number of times. Again, this is in Stanton, Virginia, but there are other reconstructions of the Blackfriars Theater. It is smaller um, and, and kind of more private. The original one was on a second floor of another building um, that I believe was an in, inn, um, which was basically a, a, a kind of a club uh, for um, lawyers. And um, it was, again, more expensive um, than the original Globe Theater was. A couple other things just about theater during the time, and then I'll talk specifically about The Tempest. Um, there were not a lot of props and scenery um, in Shakespeare's day. Um, they found some records that show kind of a list of props that they had kind of stowed away. Um, and um, some reconstructions of some shrubs and some stones and so other kind of things, but it was not like you would see today a real fully staged, you know, sort of performance in modern theater. Um, I imagine some um, Shakespeare companies today might do more dramatic, more full kind of, of scenery. Um, but um, if you're going to try and, you know, maintain the, um, the um, true to the history of the uh, the Blackfriars or the Globe, you would have relatively little in the name in, the, in terms of, of scenery, et cetera. Um, there was a trap door in the theater, so people could kind of disappear behind the trap door as they could kind of behind uh, various objects. It did not have big formal curtains like we do in theaters today. And you can kind of see from this picture of the Blackfriar as, as well as the pictures of the Globe that I had up earlier. Um, they did also have a, a pulley where they could lift people up in the air so they could kind of fly around. Um, so it did have some of the kinds of, um, um, I guess we might say very uh, simple basic technologies that we still use in the theater today. Um, the actors did roam around quite a bit. Sometimes they actually roamed around in the audience. Uh, it was also true that if you spent some extra money, 
you could actually sit in a chair that was right on the stage itself. And in fact, if you look at this picture of the Blackfriars Theater, you can see that there are indeed people sitting up on the stage itself. And back in the day, it's, you know, if you wanted to be seen, you know, somebody who was an aristocrat uh, had lots of, you know, nice clothes and wanted to be seen there. And again, this is, this is you know, the, the kind, of, um, kind of duality of the theater, that it, that it was very, you know, common with common people, working class people, that it was not viewed as, as, as a, a super reputable kind of profession to be involved in the theater, that the theaters were kind of on the bad side of the Thames. Um, but nonetheless, you would find aristocrats and, and, um, and wealthy people, you know, going to the theater, et cetera. Um, so there was, there was sort of an acknowledgement that there was something really worthwhile going on there, I think, because of that. And it was an opportunity for people who were wealthy to be seen sort of, you know, in public. Um, that's not um, also unlike, uh, let's say, um, classical music during Mozart's time. Um, Mozart was very popular, not just with um, educated people, not just again with the aristocracy, et cetera, um, but wrote music for and had as part of an audience, working class people. Um, so this is not something that is unusual, but I think it is important to kind of understand that sort of, of duality. Um, it wasn't the exact same kind of thing with Shakespeare and Mozart, but a kind of duality nonetheless. Um, that really shows that Shakespeare, like Mozart, was trying to engage broad audiences and was capable and effective of doing it as well. Right? That's the other thing. And that's part of the timeless nature of people like Mozart and Shakespeare, right? That they, they were writing um, for many segments of society and not just the learned, the educated, the wealthy, Right, um, the universal themes that they that they conveyed, uh, that they expressed, spoke to all people. And again, that's where that timelessness really comes from. Another thing that um, is interesting about theater at the time was that um, women's roles were typically played by boys, not by women. Um, there is evidence that theater, uh, even before Shakespeare's day, actually did have women performing. Certainly, in a lot of the um, the kind of theater that was part of you know traveling theater companies, where uh, you would travel from place to place, you'd have a wagon or two, and some people who were in your troupe, and you would put on some plays. Sometimes plays that you wrote yourself, other times plays that perhaps were known, or at least the stories of the plays were known, um, and you basically performed for meals and a place to stay while you were in these various towns, right? Um, certainly at that point, we can identify that kind of theater with, with you know, peasants and, and, and working class, you know, sort of people. Um, but we do believe that there were women who performed in those kinds of troops. But in Shakespeare's day, um, again, boys typically performed women's roles. Um, and as some of you might be aware, um, who know a bit of the history of classical music, oratorio and opera in particular. Um, there are roles, um, um, for example, known as, as pants roles, where you actually have um, um, altos, where there is a, um, a overlap between women's lower voice and male singing in particular in falsetto uh, will do parts of the opposite um, gender. And that's actually quite common and still done um, today. So that's some background on Shakespeare and on the theater. Um, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the setting of the play um, and the events that happen right before things start here because that's really, um, that, that's really um, I think important. Um, background. So the setting is in the Mediterranean. Um, King Alonzo and um, his, um, his son, his brother, uh, his attendants, um, and some other people are aboard a ship. 
um, and, and you see a very interesting contrast between here. Um, and, and, and again, this here we see this kind of class contrast. We see the, the people who are um, the sailors on the ship when this big storm comes up. And the sailors are basically telling um, these, these aristocrats, um, these highborn people uh, to get stay out of their way. That if they want the ship to not sink in a storm, they'll get out of the way and let the sailors do the work that they're, um, they're not just useless, they're in the way. Kind of pointing out the fact that they can't really take care of themselves. You know, if it wasn't for us, you know, you would perish in this storm, you know, kind of thing. And it even allows them to get a little mouthy with King Alonzo and, and his, his, his people. Um, and um, again, here's a great example right from the very beginning of um, people from different walks of life being portrayed in Shakespeare's work and him, and him really building in um, different aspects of, of um, the culture. I mean, the, the way that the, these um, sailors speak versus the way that the Alonzo and his people speak. Um, and um, their, their different backgrounds, um, you know, all of that kind of thing is, is clearly in evidence here. Um, the ship is returning from Tunis, which is um, the area of Carthage, um, where King Alonso has just married his daughter Clarabel off to the king of Tunisia. And clearly is worries that he's never going to see her again. That was um, a long way um, at the time. Um, if you think about, you know, um, Italy um, and think about, um, again, Carthage or Tunis being on the northern coast of, of Africa, if you kind of can put that map of the Mediterranean we've been following sort of in your head for a minute, you can kind of see um, where, um, where Tunis is located. There are references, interesting references, some kind of somewhat comedic references to Dido and Aeneas. They talk about widow Dido and Aeneas and why was she widow Dido and I'll be getting at that story of her um, losing her um, losing her first husband and then losing a second husband and, and killing herself that's in act two scene one uh, which is sort of um, again interesting um, so that's the basic kind of opening scene of the play um, I mentioned the storm that comes up the storm was artificially created by uh, Prospero. Um, Prospero and his daughter, Miranda, were, um, um, and, and Prospero had been the Duke of Milan and um, his brother Alonzo, excuse me, his brother Antonio, who is with King Alonzo on the ship, his brother Alonzo had, uh, Antonio had along with King Alonzo, um, Kind of gotten rid of him. Um, Prospero was very interested in magic and in his books and in reading, and presumably not so interested in, in acting like a duke. Um, and even sort of admits as much when he talks about talks to his daughter Miranda about what had happened when she was very young. Um, and so maybe it's under, kind of understandable that he was overthrown by his brother Antonio. But nonetheless, um, this occurs. And he and um, Prospero and Miranda are put on this boat and sent off on their way. And they end up living on this island. Um, they think originally just the two of them by themselves. Um, they've been on the island for 12 years. Miranda was three at the time. She barely remembers when Prospero talks to her about uh, how things were before they were kind of marooned on this island, uh, what their life was like. And he was the Duke of Milan and that he had a very beautiful wife and that Miranda had all kinds of attendants. She, she just very vaguely remembers lots of women sort of taking care of her, uh, which again would have been her attendants, but she would have been age three at the time. So she's now 15 because they've been on the island for 12 years. Um, and um, one of uh, somebody who was actually um, uh, a counselor to Alonzo was also a friend of Prospero's. And this is Gonzalo, another one of the relatively important characters here. Gonzalo was, a, again, a friend of Prospero's who made sure that when they were sent off on their way to eventually be marooned on this island, that they had food and clothing and things that they, they could presumably survive by themselves. 
Um, in addition to this, um, he, um, he packed for um, Prospero his books. So Prospero has been able to keep studying magic and has indeed become a very powerful magician, right? And he uses this magic essentially to create a storm, to shipwreck Alonzo, Antonio, Gonzalo, um, Alonzo's other uh, family members, his brother um, and his son um, on the island that Prosper and Miranda have, have been living on so that he can presumably kind of get back at them for what they did. In, in particular, again, for um, what Antonio, um, Prospero's brother, and King Alonzo had done since King Alonzo helped Antonio get rid of Prospero, as it were. Um, and so that's the, the, the basic you know, kind of storyline here. Um, and um, so everything after the initial shipwreck, um, and again, um, Prospero uses his magic to create this storm. Um, after everybody is shipwrecked, the rest of the story takes place on this island. And um, Prospero uses um, a spirit named Ariel. Um, first thing that's important here, Ariel is male, not female. When, Ar when people think of a spirit uh, who's kind of doing the kind of things Ariel's doing in the play, I think they might typically think of a female character. And of course, we know the name Ariel as, as a female character as well. But Ariel's a male. Ariel is a servant of Prospero's who also has magical powers. And um, Prospero uses Ariel as, as essentially a servant to help create the storm and to um, make sure that everybody survives when the ship is wrecked and that the people are marooned on the island in different groupings, um, which is very important for the way Prospero wants to um, sort of um, orchestrate the interactions between the characters and uh, what's gonna occur when he eventually does confront them and let them know that indeed he is there and, um, and uh, you know, uh, confront them about what they did to him. Um, Ariel, I mentioned, is a servant of Prospero's. I wouldn't necessarily say a slave, but a, ser a servant. Um, he, uh, Ariel had been um, imprisoned for refusing to serve uh, a character named Sikorax. Um, and Prospero freed Ariel from Sikorax. So Ariel now owes something to Prospero. So that's why Ariel kind of the servant to Prospero. Prospero keeps telling Ariel that he's going to free him. Ariel keeps waiting for this to happen. Prospero says one more favor and one more favor. And, you know, um, Ariel keeps waiting to be freed. Eventually is freed at the very end of the story. Um, Sikorax, another really important character here who I mentioned. Um, Sikorax had been um, supposedly um, abandoned on the island a long time ago. Um, we're supposed to, I think, kind of view Sikorax and um, Caliban, who um, is essentially the son of Sikorax, as the indigenous people on the island, right? When Prospero and Miranda first get there, they think they're by themselves. They eventually realize that you know, here's uh, here's the Corax, um, who again had um, taken Ariel prisoner. So Prospero uses his magic to free Ariel from Prospero, making Ariel uh, owe favors to Prospero. Um, and um, then there's there's Caliban, um, the son of uh, Sikorax. Um This. Um, Character Sikorax, um, they're eventually able to, um, Prospero is eventually able to kind of pull Caliban away from Sikorax uh, to free him essentially from, um, from his, his mother. Uh, at least they're telling him they're freeing him. They want him to feel like they're doing him a favor by um, educating him. Um, in their language, 
and uh, in particular in their language and their ways, et cetera. Um, but Caliban, on this, at the same token, as, as a local inhabitant, he knows how to survive on the island, right? He knows where to find fresh water. He knows what plants are edible, um, what other kind of animal life might exist on the island. So the Caliban, it, the way it's portrayed is the Caliban is, he thinks he's doing a favor in helping Miranda and Prospero to survive. And they're kind of thankful for him at first, but then Prospero starts to really take advantage of him, essentially enslaves him um, and makes all him do all of his dirty work for him. Um, you know, collect firewood and, and do other kind of things Prospero doesn't want to do himself. And things that you imagine Prospero could probably do with his magic if he really wanted to. Um, so we have this um, essentially a slave owner, slave relationship here or a colonizer, con uh, colonized relationship here that's really important. Um, in A Tempest, which again, we're reading for next week, uh, the rewriting, which was done in 1960s and has a real 1960s flavor to it. The language is very 1960s. Um, and in the translation that we're reading that uh, the translator really brings that out. Um, the story is told rather than from Prospero's perspective or from the playwright's sort of perspective, uh, the kind of Shakespearean perspective um, from Caliban and kind of his side of things and his um, his interpretation of events that have happened. And some of the same events will be retold, but just from Caliban's side. And it's really interesting. And it really brings out, again, this relationship between the colonizer and the colonized. Um, obviously, A Tempest is viewed as a post-colonial work because it's designed to kind of bring out these uh, and, and critique these various themes of colonialism. Um, so they definitely, um, these themes definitely exist in Shakespeare's Tempest. Um, you can certainly see places and where you can read Shakespeare's Tempest and see it as a critique of, of colonialism and be critical of Prospero in particular and the way he treats Caliban um, as well as the way Miranda treats Caliban um, versus the way they treat um, their own people, as it were, Alonzo, Antonio, et cetera. Um, people debate whether or not Shakespeare is just kind of describing early European colonialism here or whether or not he's trying to offer some kind of critique. And there are people on both sides of that debate. And it's something I think kind of interesting to think about. From our own perspective, it's easy to read it and think that it is a critique of colonialism because the themes to us are so obvious right, in our own sort of day and time. And, um, you know, when, when at least many people have been familiar with, you know, the post-colonialism, the critique of European colonialism, um, what's happened in the world since Shakespeare's time with various empires, the collapse of those empires, what's happened to their colonies, um, what we know of in terms of the way those colonies were taken advantage of, their natural resources used, I mean, all kinds of, of, of things. Um, the slave trade in, in this country, um, the treatment of, of um, Native Americans, um, and you know, around the world, um, if you look at you know the major, in particular, the major European uh, countries that had empires at various times. Um, so it's easy for us to see it as a meant to be a critique of colonialism, but that's not really that clearly the case. Um, so we're, you know, we're again you need to be aware that you're reading it from what we know. Um, what um, the way we view colonialism today, again, um, through a somewhat of a you know, post-colonial lens, and A Tempest will offer very much a post-colonial lens versus in Shakespeare's own day. So um, look out for that. Um, when, you, when you're thinking about the Tempest and when you read A Tempest, um, you'll see how those, those themes are made very explicit and it's very obviously meant to be a critique of colonialism. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the author um, who was, him, who was him, um, himself from Martinique, um, which was colonized by the French. Um, and he, had his, he lived his own life for a time as um, from the, the side of the, the colonized. Um, so we've got um, some of the things interesting in the names. Uh, if you think of the name Prospero, you see the word prosper there or kind of somebody who's fortunate. 
Um, you can also almost see the word oppressor in Prospero. So it's sort of interesting in both of those aspects. Uh, the name Miranda means worthy of admiration. Um, um, you will encounter people named Miranda. Um, um, so that's, that's become a, um, a, a fairly popular name. Caliban, um, you, can, you can almost see the word cannibal in the word Caliban. Um, I'll show you in a little bit of some, um, some pictures of Caliban. Uh, the Caliban character has become a pop culture icon, a, pop, a, a very popular pop culture uh, sort of character, sort of persona um, that again, I'll talk about in a bit. Um, supposedly too, uh, Caliban has attempted to rape Miranda, um, which is kind of one of the excuses that Prospero and Miranda use for treating him as an inferior and as violent, as less than human, right? That's something that, that um, um, of course, you would do as a colonizer of the colonized peoples is uh, justify your treatment of them by viewing them as somewhat less human than you are, especially with being human, being identified with um, intellectual ability as perceived through the lens of uh, typically European culture. Um, so it's not just um, people's presumptions about your intellectual ability, but that was all filtered through uh, your culture, right? And what looks like an exercise of intellect to you might not look like an exercise of intellect to somebody else. Um, some of you might be aware of the work of a psychologist named Howard Gardner, who's developed a somewhat controversial, but nonetheless interesting theory of multiple intelligences. Um, intelligence is typically viewed in terms of logical mathematical ability and verbal ability. Um, that's why it's the main elements of the SAT, the original SAT was an intelligence test and it even was pretty much an IQ test back when I took it in the 1980s. Um, it's more of a kind of a, a test of, 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 of knowledge today and less a test of ability. Um, but that is for a long time the way um, intelligence was viewed, right? But intelligence is a construct. There's not something in the world that's called intelligence that has a name on it, that has a label that says, you know, here I am, I'm intelligence. It's a construct, right? Societies, cultures construct basically what it means to be um, intellectual, uh, or however they might view that idea of, of the intellect. And different cultures have different things that they think of as intellectual or representing intellect or intellectual ability. And they differ from one culture to another. It depends on the demands of your culture. It depends on the kind of skills that are valued, right? So in addition to thinking about uh, colonizers, um, again, um, viewing themselves as superior to the savage colonized because they see themselves as intellectually superior, um, they may have been thinking of it a lot often in terms of raw intellectual power, but we know that, that a lot of it is just filtered through um, different cultural lenses. Um, it's coded differently, right? From one culture to another culture. Uh, the name savage is also applied to people who do not utilize natural resources the way Europeans think natural resources should be utilized. Um, that was a reason for also calling people savage, right? And that was a justification for pushing Native Americans in this country farther and farther west and onto reservations. And then when the reservation land was seen to be valuable uh, for its, um, you know, its farmland or because it had uh, gold was found there or whatever, Right, forced the Native Americans off that land, all the treaties that were broken, et cetera. Um, so again, you will see evidence of some of those themes of colonialism here. Um, another important character, one of the characters who's um, shipwrecked along with Alonzo and Antonio is Alonzo's son, who I have mentioned, his name is Fernando. He seems to be a pretty good guy. Um, Fernando and Alonzo, excuse me, Fernando, and Miranda fall in love, seems, seems almost like love at first sight, right? Um, she's the first, he's the first quote unquote normal human being other than her father, the way it's portrayed in the play that Miranda has ever known. And he's, he's gallant and, and um, everything else, right? Um, because of the way he was raised. Um, she's um, 
beautiful, uncorrupted, right? Um, genuine, um, the things that you can imagine that somebody, um, you know, who was brought up isolated from uh, an aristocratic lifestyle, right? Um, so um, she's pure, she's a virgin, she's, she's beautiful. Um, and so they seem to fall instantly in love. But Prospero has to kind of test Fernando first to make sure, right, that, um, that Fernando is worthy of, um, of marrying his daughter. Um, and here's, a, here's a, a, a picture of them. And Prospero will test Fernando a little bit to, to see again if he's, if he's kind of up to snuff. Um, some of the other characters um, is uh, Sebastian. Sebastian is Alonzo's brother. There is a, scene, a theme here. Um, first of all, a larger theme of pair, pairs of characters um, and the way those characters interact that I'm sure Shakespeare did very intentionally. Um, there's several instances of this. The first one, the one that has already kind of been unrolling itself before the play starts is the relationship between Antonio and Prospero, right, as brothers. And um, Antonio's um, overthrowing Prospero, getting rid of him, right, um, and perhaps even uh, desires at some point to, 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 you know, to get rid of him permanently. But certainly he did a pretty good job of it. Um, marooning him on this island. He doesn't think he's ever going to see him again, right? Um, Antonio, we know, kind of uh, tries to convince Sebastian to kill his brother, King Alonso, so that Sebastian will acquire all of his power, right? Um, they think that Fernando is probably dead because Fernando was intentionally shipwrecked off by himself, so that he could encounter Miranda, potentially. Um, and um, Alonzo's um, daughter, Clarabelle, we know is, is in Tunisia now. So that might mean that if Alonzo has gone, that Sebastian becomes the king of Naples, right? So again, we have the, the two big um, um, the characters here, um, aristocratic characters here. We have the king of Naples, Alonzo, Prospero, who was the Duke of Milan, now being now Antonio being the Duke of Milan. Um, so Antonio says, Sebastian, you know, let's why don't you, you know, kill off your kill off your brother and um and and we can kind of be a team and and we can rule and have all kinds of power and won't things be great? Um and actually at, at one point they they try to do this, right? When Alonzo's sleeping. Um however, um they're awoken by um, by Ariel, um, kind of of uh, essentially whispering in the ear of Alonzo, and he wakes up and um, and sees um, Sebastian kind of standing over him with a sword, and it's sort of like, "What's going on here?" And Gonzalo wants to know what's going on here, and they said, "We heard loud noise. We thought it was an animal. We were frightened, so you know, drew our swords. You know, that kind of deal uh, as an, as an excuse and a reason for why there's you know." And Alonzo seems to be, um, he's being menaced the way he is by a sword. Um, but um, so again, there's that theme of, of, of um, potentially fratricide here, right? When a brother kills another brother, uh, if Sebastian kills um, Alonzo at the bidding of Antonio. Um, I mentioned Gonzalo several times. He's a very interesting character, the counselor to Alonzo and also a friend to Prospero. Um, he is, um, at some points he seems really wise, at other points he seems kind of silly. Um, he, says things sometimes that seem kind of inappropriate. Um, he does talk about what he would do if he had the island to himself. Um, he clearly kind of sees things through the lens of a colonizer. As you can imagine, the Gonzalo character. Um, and in fact, the very reason that these people are on the ship in the first place um, and um, in the rewriting of the Tempest called A Tempest um, is because they're out to find 
you know, resources on another island somewhere. They're intentionally being, you know, acting as, um, as, a, as colonizers. Um, so Gonzalo's kind of interesting character, um, um, humorous, some of the things he says, some of the things he's done, but uh, he is important because as well as being the counselor to Alonzo, he was an old friend of Prospero's. One of the other pairs of characters that's really interesting, uh, Trinculo and Stefano, right? Um, Trinculo being Alonzo's servant, Stefano being Alonzo's butler. Uh, they're shipwrecked together um, and they act as like you could imagine um, sailors acting if they're you know, uh, marooned on an island. Um, of course, they think they're by themselves on the island. All these separate groups of people uh, all think that the only ones that they're survived potentially. And so they might think that they're all alone. Um, and um, they start, you know, getting into alcohol, et cetera. Then they stumble upon Caliban. Um, and um, here is one of the places where we see Caliban really treated as a savage, right? He's, he's seen as being um, entertaining um, as somebody that, um, you know, maybe they could, uh, in theory, capture him and um, put him on display back in, you know, back in Italy somewhere, um, make a spectacle of him, right? The kind of things that you saw actually done to people who were colonized. This was definitely true of Native Americans through the, uh, the Wild West shows uh, that were, were put on, um, where people either dressed up Native, like Native Americans or actually they employed Native Americans themselves, while Bill's uh, Wild West show being the most famous. Um, you can think of similar examples in um, minstrel shows in this country, with people appearing in blackface and the long history of, of, of that. Um, so again, when you read A Tempest, um, be in particular, you know, kind of look out for the way that that is portrayed. It's, it's, um, it's evident in Shakespeare's version, but it's not really super highlighted. It's very much highlighted in Cesar's A Tempest. Um, Caliban uh, uh, wants to try and convince Trinculo and Stefano to try and kill Prospero. So the Caliban will be freed, right? Um, Caliban is really treated like a slave by Prospero and even to an extent by Miranda. Ariel again is different, treated more as like a servant who will one day be freed, um, but still who owes something to Prospero. So look at the different treatment of those two characters, the servant and the slave on the part of Prospero. Um, I think you'll find that that, again, is also interesting and important. So these, um, these, these um, pairs of characters um, are something to, to kind of um, look out for here as well. Um, that's what I had for you in my lecture. I think I've covered everything that I wanted to cover. Um, let me just show you briefly some interesting pictures of Caliban. Um, Here's a picture from um, what appears to be a stage or film production of the Tempest of the Caliban character. Um, again, kind of viewed as part human. It almost looks like um, this Caliban has, has shells uh, around his head and on his arm. Um, almost viewed as kind of a cannibalistic kind of character. I mentioned the Caliban becoming part of popular culture. Um, there actually is, or at least was at some point, you can look this up on Wikipedia, a kind of a hardcore heavy metal band called Caliban um, that um, some of their songs um, are again, looking at things from Caliban's side. Um, it's really loud and brash, you know, obviously very aggressive music. Um, even more famously, there's a Caliban Marvel Comics character. Um, as you know, the different Marvel Comics characters, um, they are given different kinds of, of um, special abilities. That's true of the, um, the Caliban comic character. And um, I'm just looking here briefly at um, Caliban comics from Wikipedia. Um, he first appears in Uncanny X-Men which was 1981. 
in Uncanny X-Men 148. Um, he is born an albino mutant with a pale complexion and large yellow eyes. At some point in his life, he's banished from his home by his father, who called him Caliban after a character from the play The Tempest by William Shakespeare, obviously. Um, his, he has a special ability to sense and track other mutants. Uh, he has superhuman strength. He had a formal ability, which is to sense and manipulate fears, ability to generate um, psychoactive virus that attacks the mental functions of other people. Um, growing up, a still young Caliban who speaks in the third person is discovered by the mutant Callisto and taken under her wing. Um, these are other characters. Um, learning his mutant tracking ability, Callisto uses Caliban to locate other disenfranchised mutants and organizes them into the Morlocks, a band of homeless rejected mutants. As you know, Marvel Comics borrows from, from mythology, borrows from theater. So we're throwing together this hodgepodge of, of different characters. Um, so we have Caliban, Callisto, Mask, Plague, and Sunder. The Morlocks live in the sewers and abandoned subway tunnels running underneath New York City. And like Caliban, most of them had um, a kind of supposedly grotesque appearance. Um, so, um, and, and this is only one of many, many examples of the way Shakespeare has made his way into you know, popular culture. And this particular play, there are quite a number of famous quotes from this play. Um, you might recognize some of them as you read. Um, I have a compendium of famous quotations. Um, and uh, you know, from literature, poetry, um, statesmen, et cetera. And a very large section of it is just for Shakespeare um, and Shakespeare's plays. And again, it speaks to the fact that they um, resonate with all kinds of people. Uh, they're not all just things that you have to be really educated and learned to recognize um, because they, again, are, are not just um, kind of famous quotations from intellectual or academic culture, but also from popular culture. Um, that's obviously why, you know, we read Shakespeare in humanities and why there's a, a Shakespeare requirement. Um, so again, um, I will be um, early next week upping my lecture on A Tempest, um, please make sure to have that um, read um, for early next week. I think you'll find it really interesting. Um, it'll be a very different reading experience because it uses the R God of the, the 1960s um, and, and Cesar's original language as it was translated into English. Um, and I, I, think, I, I think you'll find it entertaining and insightful as a post-colonial piece of literature. So I'll, I'll post a lecture also talking about that. Uh, for those of you who haven't yet um, upped your discussion questions for Shakespeare, um, if you haven't done those yet, you know, please try to do those. There are actually nine sets of questions. I sent an announcement out uh, earlier today, um, this is Sunday, um, that you could do any of those nine question sets that you want to do. You don't have to do the one from your particular group. Um, and that I would be covering those uh, set question sets, both in the lecture that I just did and also in my lecture for A Tempest that I'll be doing on Monday. Um, so I'll see everybody again early next week. As always, any questions you have, any issues thinking about papers, exams, et cetera, please feel free to email me. You'll notice on the syllabus, I did also set aside a, a time to talk about the, the final exam um, as well. And I believe I've already posted the paper topics for the third and final paper. Um, remember you need an outside resource for that paper. You can and should use, I'm assuming, the text from class from the particular question uh, set that you're going to be responding to for your third uh, thematic paper. Um, but please remember also to use an outside resource for that as well. Um, to look at for what for, for what I'm looking for there and what my expectations are, please look in the syllabus under thematic papers, and you'll see there's a special mention there of thematic paper number three. But again, you can always uh, email me if you have questions or issues with that.